Welcome to another exciting podcast of Royal Oak Victory Church. We're glad you've joined us. We are a community devoted to God, connected to others, and influencing our world. But you know, I want to I want to share another real special praise report that took place uh, just this week. Uh, as many of you know, we're in the process of. Um, of, of starting what we call our three-phase building project, phase three of our, our, our church here. Uh, in fact, it was three Sundays ago uh, when we all gathered outside in the back of the building and we broke ground. How many were at our groundbreaking uh, ceremony? Okay, many of you were. It was about 500 below that morning. And uh, we were able to break ground only because uh, Dave, who heads up our building management, uh, he heated the ground for three days before. And, and so we broke ground three weeks ago. It was pretty exciting. And, um, and so that was kind of the, the initial stage of our phase three plan for uh, our building. And, and if you're here, and I know we have some visitors here, if you're here and you're wondering what phase three is all about, well, I'll just explain a, a, a little bit of it in a nutshell. Uh, phase three, we're in phase two now, but phase three includes a, a, a two-story children's wing on this side of the building. So, so, so in other words, we're going to build outside. We're going to have a wraparound two-story wing that will hold our children on this side, and it'll come all the way around. And then on this side, uh, we're going to build a two-story administration wing that will house all our offices. And so uh, this is all going on outside. It will be part of the existing building, but it's two stories all the way around. And so, um, so what that means is because our offices will now be on, uh, in that phase, um, uh, what we'll be able to do is tear our offices out in the foyer, and it will double the size of our foyer. So phase three actually includes um, a foyer from glass block to glass block, and, um, and then the other part of phase three is that we would tear down these walls because on the other side of these walls are children's rooms. And, of course, we won't need the children's rooms because we have our two-story children's wing that we'll be building. And so uh, the plan is to tear down these walls and enlarge the sanctuary size by about 200 seats. And, of course, when we went to the city, because you have to go to the city to ask permission, they were fine with everything on the outside everything about phase three except enlarging this space. And um, the reason they s said that, uh, that, that they, 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 they weren't for it was because um, we're not zoned for that, right? We're a medium church, and if we knock the walls out uh, of this room, we'll then be a large church, and we're not, we're not zoned to be a large church. And so they told us we had to go through a, a rezoning. It's called a land redesignation application on the property. And, of course, those of you who are familiar with that kind of stuff, you know that's not an easy thing to do. It really isn't. Uh, you have to advertise your rezoning plan uh, online and in the paper. And then, of course, you have to meet with all the various individuals and departments within the city. Uh, then you have to have an open house, which we did, and then, then you have to make a presentation to the City Planning Commission, and if, if it passes that level, then finally it goes down to City Hall where the mayor and all the city councilors vote on it, right? And so as I mentioned last Sunday, that final meeting, the meeting at City Hall with the mayor and the councilors took place just this past Tuesday, uh, Pastor Sheldon and I went down to the city. I made a presentation, and you know, I have, to, I have to admit, I was pretty nervous. I mean, I speak in front of people all the time, but I was, I was pretty nervous. It's kind of intimidating to do it, and, um, and, and then also, I didn't know what would come of it, whether it be yay or nay or what would take place, but you know, rather than explaining it to you, I thought it would be better if we actually showed you what took place. Because City Hall, they, they film that stuff. Um, and so we have a, a clip of our thing. And let me just set it up. What's happened is the city uh, planner has just got up and he's talked about our project. And uh, this is uh, where the clip uh, follows into. Thanks very much. Let's open the public hearing on this matter then. Anyone wish to speak in favor of this item? Um, good morning, Your Worship, City Councilors, and um, City staff. 
My name is Dave Myers, and I'm the lead pastor of Royal Oak Victory Church. Uh, it's an honor to speak to you today in favor of our project that is currently before you. Royal Oak Victory Church was founded in 1990 as Northwest Victory Church, and we started in the Varsity Community Center. Uh, we moved to the community of Royal Oak in 2005 and changed our name to reflect our new location, uh, and our dedication was to serve the community. Uh, at that time, we built phase one of our building, and then in order to meet the expanding needs of the surrounding community, we constructed phase two in 2010. We are here today requesting permission to expand once again due to the growing needs uh, of those we serve. Uh, one thing we noticed early on when we moved to our current location uh, was the fact that Royal Oak and Rocky Ridge were without a proper community facility, including a functioning community center. Uh, it was back then that we made the commitment that our building would be available for that purpose, and we have worked together with the Rocky Ridge Royal Oak Community Association to see that this has continued to happen. Since that time, we have uh, offered our building free of charge to the Community Association for any event that they wish to hold. Um, some of the events are their annual general meeting and also uh, community functions such as movie nights and sports days. We also co-run a free community event every May uh, with the community association. Uh, we call Family Fun Day, uh, which brings out approximately 2,500 people to that event. Uh, this ongoing relationship has been very beneficial to everyone in the community and we look forward to continuing this strong relationship in the future. As part of this application process and in respect of those strong ties, we met with the community association to present our project and answer any questions they may have. We also held a public open house to allow for broader community um, uh, input and to have their say as well. In both regards, our project was extremely well received and as you will note in your package, there is a letter of support from the Rocky Ridge Royal Oak Community Association in respect to it. Of course, our commitment to the community extends beyond just the community association itself. Uh, we have partnered with uh, a preschool, a daycare, a before and after school program, an additional church congregation that meets in our building, uh, local girl guides, the Canadian blood services that use our building, uh, throughout the year uh, so that we might provide services for the community. Many of these organizations are very excited about the opportunity that this proposed expansion provides and as you can see in your package they have also provided letters of support for the project. This land use redesignation and the subsequent renovation to the main assembly area of our building is needed <coughs> for us to continue to meet the ever-expanding needs of our community. The needs and desires of the community have outgrown our existing facility and in order to meet them and maintain these strong relationships, we need the ability to grow and meet these requests. It is with this in mind that we request the approval of our application. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Pastor. Thanks for being here. You know, this one, this one actually uh, stuck to me as well, and I'm, I'm glad you raised it because this category, place of worship large, we have traditionally had trouble finding appropriate places for it, particularly as both Christian congregations, some Christian congregations tend to get larger and larger, but also for lots of places of worship for, for example, the Sikh community and the Muslim community. And we've, we've had a lot of trouble citing them. You know, the days when every neighborhood plan had corners for churches uh, are long gone. But in this particular case, what struck me about it without presupposing the public hearing is this is an ideal location for a place of worship large. And so I was, and in fact, my own community was thinking of building in this exact area. Um, and so I was a bit surprised that the existing land use only allowed place of worship medium. And yes, it's only 200 seats, but at some point you're always going to have that one seat that knocks you over to the next one, right? But 
it, I, I wonder if the base was wrong here. And if the base was wrong, would there have been an easier way than to make the congregation go through all these hoops? I, I don't know that there would have been, but I certainly noticed it myself. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you for, for everything, here. and thanks for being here. And hopefully at least it was an easy process, although probably much more strenuous than it needed to be. Thank you. Thank you. And so it was exciting to see when the mayor actually uh, said he was in support of our uh, proposal. I was shocked. I didn't know what he was going to say. He didn't say we were there for th two hours prior to that, and there were a lot of other things that came up. He didn't speak very much. So then when he started to speak on our, you know, over ours, I was wondering. But it was very positive. And uh, what I'd like to show you is the wrap-up. In other words, the vote, because they all have to vote. And so why don't we put that up? On that note, I'd like to... Uh Move this in three readings, please. Thank you. Do I have a seconder, please? Councillor Maglioka, thank you. All right, on the recommendations before you then, on the recommendations before you, are we agreed? Any opposed? That's carried, thank you. Bylaw 38D 2018 then, first reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Second reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Authorization for third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? Third reading of the bylaw, are we agreed? Any opposed? That is carried, thank you. All in favor, no opposed. Amen. So, so yeah, uh, that's exciting. We're glad that that part's over. Now what it means is that we have permission by the city to build everything that uh, uh, we plan to build and that it's full speed ahead. And uh, we'll continue to uh, keep you updated on uh, the developments and how things are progressing. Uh, right now, it looks like we'll, uh, although we had our groundbreaking service three weeks ago, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, ha we'll, we'll, we'll officially be breaking ground. In other words, the machinery will be in probably um, March 6th, around that time, the first uh, week or so in March, and we'll keep you posted. But, you know, this morning what I'd like to do is touch on an aspect of the building project that we haven't really talked about very much at all. And this has to do with the massive tree uh, that's erected in our foyer. And how many here, when you came in this morning, you, you saw the tree? Okay, how many missed the tree? Okay, a lot of you missed it. Well, well if you missed the tree, I would encourage you to grab another cup of coffee... Uh, because it really is, it, it's kind of hard to miss, it really is. And um, if you did miss the tree, we have a camera shot of it right now, I think on the big screen. Um, that's, there it is there. So, um, so that's the tree. It's actually on that whole wall there. Um, I don't know how you can miss it, but I know that people, you know, they come to church, they're busy, they're active, and lots on the grow, go. So, um, so, so that's, the, that's the tree. And, um, uh, you know, this morning what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about it. Uh, because it really ties into uh, something we're starting this morning. Um, we're starting a, an all-church uh, campaign we're calling Hope Grows Here. Hope grows here. Let's say that together. Hope grows here. And, you know, it's taken out of a series of parables that Jesus himself uh, touches on in the book of Matthew. And this morning what I'd like to do is, is go there. I'd like us to take a look at them. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, turn them on or turn them to Matthew chapter 13. And we're just going to look at, a, a, at kind of a, 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 the, 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 sort of the introduction uh, to this campaign called Hope Grows Here. You know, those of you who are familiar with this particular chapter will know that it's a verse-by-verse -verse discourse that Jesus gives uh, on the topic of the kingdom of heaven. Of course, another name for it is the kingdom of God. And that's why one of the most common statements you'll find all through this chapter, repeated over and over again, is the phrase, the kingdom of heaven is light. Uh, you see it in verse 24, verse 31, verse 44, verse 45, verse 47. It's everywhere in this chapter. But, you know, the one I want to focus in on this morning is found uh, here in verse 33. And so we're turning to Matthew 13, verse 33. Uh, these are the words of Jesus. He said, The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast... Let's say that together. Little yeast. Let's say it again. Little yeast. In three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. And so what this verse is actually dealing with is really what I call the incredible 
power and influence of the small, the power of the small. And, you know, this morning what I'd like to do is share with you what I see as being three universal laws when it comes to understanding how God's kingdom works in our lives. These are three laws of the kingdom, and so I want to just quickly go through it. You know, the first law of the kingdom is this one, is it begins in weakness. In other words, as strong and as powerful as God is, and we know He is, as majestic, as grand, as mighty, as sovereign as God is, when it comes to establishing His will and purposes, His kingdom here on earth, oftentimes, and this is a great mystery, but oftentimes it, uh, it starts in very small and significant ways. And of course, that's exactly what this parable says here. Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread, even though she put only a little yeast, in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. And so we see that this woman didn't start with a large amount. It was a very small, tiny measure of yeast. And you know, the interesting thing is that oftentimes that's exactly the way God chooses to work when it comes to establishing His kingdom. That when, uh, when He seeks to do a great work, a grand work, Uh, of His kingdom, it often begins in some very small and humble ways. Uh, It's sown in weakness. You you see this all through Scripture. You see it when it came to uh, Abraham and Sarah. God wants to create a nation of people to call His own. And so who does He choose? Abraham and Sarah who were well past childbearing age, and even when they were in childbearing age, they couldn't bear children. And you know, if I was God looking down at the earth, looking for an appropriate couple to start a nation out of, I sure wouldn't have picked Abraham and Sarah, but that's exactly what God does. They were just a little yeast. Of course, you see it in the story of Gideon. The Bible says that he was the least of the least of the least, the, the, the least person in, in the least family, in the least tribe of Israel, and yet God chose him to deliver the nation of Israel from the Midianites. Uh, you saw that with, with King David. Although he ended his life as a, as a very powerful king, he started as a small shepherd boy who wasn't even invited to the, the inauguration when p- the prophet Samuel came to, to his house and asked Jesse, the father, to bring the sons in. David wasn't even invited to the party. He was just a little yeast. Peter, a rough-and-tumble fisherman, Mary Magdalene, who was, a, was an ex-prostitute. I mean, that wouldn't have been my pick of the week, I'll tell you. But that's the way God does His, His, His work. I mean, even think of Jesus Himself when He came to earth. He didn't come as a king sitting on a throne holding a scepter in His hand. That when Jesus entered this world, He came as a helpless little baby born in a stable. It's almost inconceivable to think that the God of heaven and earth, the God who spoke the very worlds into existence, the God whom the Bible says holds the oceans in the palm of His hands, it's almost inconceivable to think that that God would make His grand entrance into the world in the form of a helpless little baby. But that's exactly the way the kingdom of heaven works, that it's sown in weakness, it's planted in humility. And you know, I don't know about you, but I kind of like that truth about God. Because what it reminds me, and sometimes we need to remind ourselves, what it reminds me is that God isn't all that interested in my strength and my nobility. God isn't really all that impressed with my great intellect and wisdom, but rather He chooses to meet me in what I call the weak and needy places of my life. And You know, that's one thing about God that I still find amazing that he's much more interested in my weaknesses than my strength because it's in, his, in my weaknesses where God's power shows up the most. I love what God said through the prophet Isaiah, verse 57, 15. Look at this. He says, I am the high and holy God who lives forever. I live in a high and holy place. In other words, God is as big, He's as grand, He's as holy, as majestic as as you can ever get. He's as big as big can ever be. And yet what I find interesting is that this almighty, majestic, big and grand God hangs out with a very different kind of crowd. 
You see it in the very next statement. It says, but I also live with people who are crushed and humble so I can restore their confidence and hope. I love that verse. Because maybe, you, you know, you might be here this morning, you might be feeling that way, crushed and humbled. You might be going through a season of your life where you just feel like you're out of control. You can't handle it. It's too much for you. You know, you might feel like you're a failure and a loser. And why would God ever be interested in someone like you? Well, He is more than interested in you because it's out of weakness and need and hunger and vulnerability that God does His greatest work in. Are you with me this morning? How many are awake? How many have had the second cup? You're all right? Okay. And, um, and those are the kinds of people whom God is able to work His greater measure of His kingdom through. And so you know what that means? The next time the devil comes to you, and he comes to us all the time, whispering how much of a loser we are. How many have ever had those bouts where that voice, that voice inside your head just tells you how weak you are, how foolish you are, how pathetic and deficient you are? You know, the next time the devil comes yakking at you about how weak you are, don't have an argument with him. Don't say, no, I'm not. And he'll say, yes, you are. And you say, no, I'm not. Don't have an argument with him. Just tell him, well, you know, that might be true, devil, but those are the very qualities God is looking for when it comes to doing a great work of his kingdom. Are you with me? And so the first law of the kingdom is that it begins in weakness. You know, the second law is it grows in multiples, multiples. And, of course, you see that in this parable. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a, a, the yeast a woman puts in, in making bread. Even though she only put in a little yeast in the measure of flour, it permeates, permeated every part of the dough. You know, that's the amazing thing about yeast, that although it's very tiny, it's very small in size, it has the ability to multiply itself many times over. In fact, I have a cookbook in my, at my house. My mom actually gave it to me when I left. Uh, left uh, living at home, you know, that, that was many years ago. She, she prayed a blessing over me and gave me a cookbook. It was called The Joy of Cooking. Back then, they didn't have Pinterest and the internet and all that stuff. If you wanted a recipe, you had to find it by a book. My mom, believing the best, just put that book in my hand. I've had it ever since. I learned to cook out of that book, The Joy of Cooking. And, you know, just out of curiosity, I opened that book, and um, this is what it says about yeast. It has a little write-up about it. It says that yeast are living organisms with 3,200 billion cells per every pound. 3,200 billion cells per pound. How many know that's a lot of cells? That's a lot of life. It says they feed off sugar, they produce carbon dioxide, and when flour is mixed together with water to form dough, those living organisms in the yeast eventually infect and permeate the entire mixture. That is the multiplying nature of this thing called yeast. And Jesus said that's exactly what the kingdom of heaven is like. That although it might start in a very weak, in very insignificant ways, you better look out. Because over time and under the right conditions, it has the ability to multiply and grow until everything around it is influenced and infected by it. How many here have been influenced by the kingdom of God? One, okay, a few of you. How many have been infected by the kingdom of God? That you were living for yourself, you were going your own way, doing your own thing, and all of a sudden God showed up in your life and an impartation of His grace and mercy and love came upon you and you were forever changed. Yeah, that's a good... That's, a... that's the nature of the kingdom of God. And you know, I saw it so powerfully in my own life, I've seen it many times, but you know, at the age of 21, I crossed the line of faith and came to Christ. And after I, I crossed the line of faith, I found out that there were five of my friends who had done exactly the same thing. They did it before me. I didn't know. They did it before me. And I found out that these five friends, every Wednesday night, they would meet together for prayer. And at that prayer meeting, they would have a basket. 
And in that basket, they would place the names of people whom they were praying for. And I found out later, after I became a Christian, that my name was in the basket. I was a basket case. (laughs) In a good way. They put my name in that basket. They prayed over me for weeks. And because of it, I'll tell you, it wouldn't be long before I, I became the, inf- the influence. And, and I got touched by the power of Christ. And so that is the highly contagious, infectious nature of the kingdom of God. But although it might begin very small, a very inconsequential ways, over time it has the ability to touch and influence everything around it. And that's why Jesus said what he did in Matthew 16, 18. He said, I will build a church so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will be able to keep it out. That's the promise of Jesus. He's going to build the church. You know, we live in a day where people say, well, the church is a thing of the past. People don't believe in God. People aren't Christians anymore. The, the church is getting weaker and weaker. Well, I don't believe that. Not in, a, not in a million years. Why don't I believe that? It's the promise of Christ. He said he'd build his church. How is he going to build it? A wimpy, weak-kneed church that will get stomped on by the secular society that we live in? No, that's not the church Christ is building. He says, I'm going to build it, my church Uh, was so expansive with energy that not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. How many are with me this morning? That's the kind of church we belong to. We're not getting weaker, we're getting stronger. We're not getting smaller, we're getting larger. We're not losing our influence. God is giving us the keys to the kingdom and He's going to do whatever He declared that He would do through us, His church. It's the nature of the kingdom. It's infectious. That's why Paul the Apostle said what he did in Philippians 1.6. He says, I am certain, I am certain that God who began the good work within you will continue His work until it is fully finished on the day when Christ Jesus returns. I'm certain. One translation says, I am confident of this very thing, that God who started a good work, He's going to complete it. It is the infectious nature of God's kingdom within you. Turn to the person next to you and say, He's going to finish it. Tell them that. He's going to finish it. You might say, well, it hasn't even started. And maybe for you it hasn't. But some of you say, man, it seems like I'm way behind schedule. God's promise to you is He is going to finish what He started because that is the nature of His kingdom. I love what John said in 1 John 4, 4. Very familiar. Greater is He that is in you than he that's in the world. Greater is the kingdom with us, in us, than the kingdom that's out there. It's greater greater. It's the nature of the kingdom. And so maybe you're here this morning and you're feeling a little bit weak. Maybe you're feeling a little small. Maybe you're wrestling with nagging thoughts of inferiority and and limitations. We all go through times like that. Uh, You know, if you're facing that stuff, you need to know that by yielding, surrendering yourself to Christ, His mercy, His grace in your life, allowing Him to come and touch you, that those very areas of weakness and defects and limitation and fears can become the very soil from where His power and strength shows up best. Your weakness is an opportunity for His strength. Do you believe that this morning? And so the nature of God's kingdom is it begins in weakness, it grows in multitudes and then multiples, and then lastly this morning, it matures in purpose. It has a purpose. And this truth really comes out in the parable Jesus gives us just before this one. Just before, the parable before. And I want us to look at it here. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of all garden plants. It grows into a tree, and the birds come and make their nest in its branches. And you know, here we have a play-by-play account of the incredible influence God's kingdom has on everything that it touches. That although it begins small, how small? Small like a mustard seed. 
You might say, well, how big is a mustard seed? Well, I happen to have a picture of one here this morning. That's how big a mustard seed is. It's not very big, right? It's a good thing I'm not a gardener. I'd lose all my mustard seeds. They're so small. They're small. They're tiny. And Jesus said that that's the way God's kingdom is. It starts off very small and insignificant. Over time, though, under the right conditions, it ends up beginning coming the largest plan in the garden. How large? So large that Jesus says the birds of the air come and build their nest in its branches. And of course, what this is talking about is the incredible influence and growth the kingdom of God has both in our lives personally and in the lives of those around us as well. And I just love the imagery that Jesus uses here. He says the kingdom of heaven is like a tree. A big tree, not a little tree. It's a big tree. And that tree gives shelter and safety and strength and refuge to all the birds that come and make their home in that tree. They build nests in the branches. The birds come and find refuge. And of course, we've certainly seen a lot of that take place in our church. Since the, the founding of our church in 1990, we've seen countless of number of people come under the safety and shelter and blessing of this tree called Royal Oak Victory Church. All kinds of birds have come. We've seen white birds come. We've seen black birds come. We've seen yellow birds and gray birds. We've seen birds of every shape and size. We've seen birds of every color and nationality come under our tree because one of our values is we are a multicultural congregation and we value every culture that God has created here on earth. You know, I was just through our break, um, you know, we were talking a little bit about it. You know, some people say, I'm colorblind. For me, it's not black or white, I'm colorblind. And, you know, I don't agree with that at all. I'm not colorblind. God's not colorblind. If God was colorblind, He'd make everyone the same color. I'm not colorblind at all. I see white. I see black. I see yellow. I see brown. And the reason I see it is because God saw it. God didn't just see it. He created it. Every culture, every nationality on the face of the earth is a testimony to the glory of God. Every culture is precious in His sight. Every culture should be celebrated and, and, and lifted up. Every culture is a creation of God. Amen? And so that's why I say we've seen a whole lot of birds come in this place. All kinds. And you know, that's why we've called this campaign Hope Grows Here. Because that's exactly what God has done as we have chosen to serve and follow Him as a church these many years. He has filled our lives and He's filled this place with His unstoppable, unquenchable healing and hope. And you know, from the first day we announced the capital campaign, the, the, the building campaign, phase three of the building project, uh, we've had people come and ask us, some of you have asked us, they said, how can we contribute financially to help raise money uh, towards phase three, the building project? And of course, that's where the tree in the foyer comes in. I'm going to explain in a minute. I told you I'd get back to the tree. We're, we're making our, our way around to the tree. But you know, um, we were sitting as staff, and uh, not just as staff, but as a board of management, uh, and also our elders board, and, and we thought, what would be a good goal to raise uh, financially in the next year? And the figure we came up with was this one right here. One million over this next year. That, that's the goal. Now, of course, you might ask, well, why, why, would, why, why, why a million? Why, why do you want to raise a million in a year? Well, uh, because currently what is owed on our mortgage is uh, this figure right here. I know it. Uh, 1,324,000 is currently owing on our mortgage. 
And so when I met with Pastor Sheldon, who does all our finances, because he's not just a pastor, he's an accountant. It's awesome to have a pastor accountant on staff. And I said to him, you know, um, what, what, what would the figure be if we continue to make our regular monthly mortgage payments on the building? What would the figure be? He said, well, if we just make our regular payments, the figure would be 324000 over the year. And so that means the remainder is a million. Just one cool million dollars. It makes sense to me. Right? And I thought, wouldn't it be awesome if, if we raised a million dollars? Now, let me stretch your mind a little bit. Um, some of you are getting nervous. You're holding on to your wallets already. Where's your purse, dear? Wouldn't it be awesome if a year from now, now listen to me, we could stand up and say, you know what, we've, we've, we've paid off our entire debt on phase two of our building. Wouldn't it be awesome? I think it would be. Wouldn't it be awesome, think about this, if, 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 if when we do our grand opening of phase three, and we invite the mayor, he might come because he likes us, you saw that. <laughs> Maybe he'd even cut the ribbon. Wouldn't it be awesome if, if, if during our grand opening uh, we were able to, to burn the mortgage on the same uh, day we, we, we did our grand opening? What's that? I can't hear that, but uh, it'd be awesome, I think. You know, we, some of you say, well, that, could that really happen? Well, it did happen when we did. When we went from phase one to phase two, and how many were here when we broke ground for phase two? Okay, you were at the groundbreaking. It was so awesome because what we, what we did is, is the place that you're sitting right now was a field, right? Like you're, you're actually sitting under gopher layers and things like that. This was a field. This, this auditorium didn't even exist. We, we had church in that part. And so what we did when, when we were going ahead in phase two is, is we had a dual ceremony. It was so exciting. On, on this side of the field, right sitting, Sean, if you could wave right about where Sean is, we went over and we burned the mortgage. And then we walked over all the way over to this side where George is. Can you wave, George, right there? And we broke ground. It was a dual ceremony, mortgage burning, groundbreaking for phase two. And I say, you know, if we did it for, for back then, we could do it again. Couldn't we? Okay, we got one excited person. <laughs> Amen. And so, um, so, so I just thought about that. You know, maybe we could do both together. And, um, of course, uh, that's where the tree comes in. We're back to the tree. Uh, because the whole idea is that, um, that we, have, we have leaves here, gold leaves, um, right here. And we have a thousand of them. Okay, so if you take a million dollars and divide it by a thousand, what do you get? What? A thousand. Some of you had to almost get your phone and figure that out. But. <laughs> a thousand. We have a thousand leaves, and so each leaf represents a thousand dollars. And so we thought, wouldn't it be awesome if every time uh, $1,000 comes in, we would put one of these leaves on the tree so that by this time next year, the tree would have 1,000 leaves on it. How many think that would be neat? Yeah. And of course, you know what would really be neat is if, we, if every time a leaf, or you know, maybe, maybe one week we put on one leaf, one leaf, one week we put on ten leaves. But every time, uh, every week we take a picture, the same place, take a picture, right? And then, and then, and then you do a time lapse, right? And all the, the leaves just popping out on the tree. Man, I'd love to see that on Facebook. Right? Just, just, you know, just popping out as the leaves go on. But of course, the leaves aren't just going to magically appear on their own. I wish they would. Right? That um, uh, they are going to get placed on the tree as the money comes in, and that's where all of us come in. Okay? And so I want the ushers. I have, a, I have something I'd like to hand out this morning. So if you could just come and hand out it. Uh, to everyone uh, one of these cards. It's called a Hope Grows Here card. And let me say that if you're visiting with us, uh, this is sort of a family talk. And um, this has nothing to do with you. I mean, if you want to contribute, that's fine. 
Um, but I don't want you to go away saying, yeah, I went to that church and all they talked about was money and trees and leaves. Uh, this is something that we're doing as a church family. We, we're, we're glad that you are here, but uh, uh, feel no obligation if you're a visitor. But these are, uh, these are a Hope Grows Here card, and you can see here, one year, phase three, capital campaign. Uh, we have the, the Scripture here. It is like a tiny mustard seed, right? The kingdom of God that a man plants in his garden and it grows and becomes a tree and the birds make their nest in the branches. And of course, then what we have is just some kind of, uh, you know, how you can calculate some giving. So what we're asking uh, you to do is to take these home. Take them home and pray. Say, well, what am I praying about? Pr pray and ask God what He would have you commit over this coming year. It's really between you and God. And let me say that there's no guilt involved. There's, there's no pressure involved in any way. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. And so this is strictly between you and Him and what He lays on your heart. And so I would ask you to take these home this week. Ask God. Really focus in on it. Ask God what He would have you give you. It's husband and wife. You'd want to talk about it. Um, and then next Sunday, what we're going to do is we're going to collect these. And, um, and we're going to see how close it comes to our million-dollar goal. How many are with me? It got real quiet now. Our million dollars. I'm, you know, I'm excited to see what God is going to do in and through us in this next year. Uh, just how much He's going to continue to grow and expand us as a church. Uh, just how much He's uh, going to move in our midst as a church. Just how, how, how many birds, people, marriages, families, singles, young people, children, lost and hurting people in this city, how many more He's going to bring into the shelter of this church. I'm excited to see what God is going to do. Are you excited with me? Amen.